Hi, everybody. Apologies, I can't be there in person to give you this presentation, but at the request of Keshni, I pre-recorded it. So hopefully you'll get as much out of it. And uh, of course, you know, for those of you who know me, I have office hours uh, already booked out. There's some few for next week, I think. So feel free to book in some office hours if you've got any other questions on this, uh, on, on what I'm about to present today. So for those of you who don't know me, uh, I guess there's a, a few out there that I might not have spoken to. Previously, my name is Bayer Patel. I'm the Managing Director at Atom CTO. We work with startups, small businesses, companies around about up to about 100, 150 uh, employees. Uh, I've had 25 years plus in the uh, in the tech industry and have been the CTO for a number of businesses across the world. We've raised money. Uh, we've also um, scaled businesses. So I've been working across many, many different sectors, so from construction to fintech to health tech to e-commerce. So I've, over the last 25 years, seen quite a broad range of, of different companies at different sizes and different maturity levels. Uh, as you know, I'm obviously a startup mentor. And what I like to say and what we like to do at, at Atom is to ensure that tech drives growth for the business, right? So for us, it's it's about making sure that the business and tech are aligned. And as the slogan goes, you know, we're, we're technically focused, but commercially driven. So what I'm going to talk to you today is about the six keys to product development. Now, what happens is when people come to us, right, they basically come to us asking us to, to build something, right? Someone will come, oh, I need to build a mobile app or I want to build a web app. They'll come up with the thing that they want to, to build. And we, before we even talk about technology, you know, what, what it is, that is um, you know, how it'll be structured data and all this kind of stuff, we try to go back to basics. So this is a methodology that I've created over the last 10, 15 years working with with startups and it's been a very effective to get startups up with the right structure early on. Uh, and this framework itself is taken from another framework called the Zachman framework. So that's Z-A-C-H-M-A-N-N framework. It's a much more complex framework that deals with designing large complex systems. Uh, and what I've done is I've kind of synthesized that down into something a little bit simpler. And really what I here, when I, when I speak to founders, I say to them, okay, we need to answer these six key questions. And they all follow from each other, but they all then play in together. And, and this is very important because going through this process and this planning process helps you shape how you're developing your product. Because for me, an app is not a business, right? You all as, you all as founders are trying to create businesses. An app is not a business. An app is just one of the tools that you're using to sell your product or service, right? So when people come to us and say, I want to build an app, that's fine. But we say, well, how are you going to support it? How are you actually going to run it? How are you marketing it? How are you selling it? All of those different things. Because that's what you need. You need a tech strategy that actually supports your business and not just an application that you're building or one of the applications that you're building. So let's get into the first, uh, the first key. So the first one is obvious. It's who, right? And... It sounds obvious, but a lot of times when companies come to us or individuals come to us, you know, when you try and ask them who's going to be the uh, you know audience for your for your product or service, they go, "Oh, everyone, everyone's got internet," and actually, not that's not the case, right? You really need to make sure that you segment your customers. And I know I've been on various um, uh, presentations with you guys before where we talked about you know refining the customer, and really, what you need to do is ensure that okay. Who are, the, who are the stakeholders who will be interacting with your business, not just your application, but with your business, right? So that's not just customers and that's the segmented customers. It's also gonna be your employees. It's gonna be your suppliers. It's anyone that you've identified, let's say in your lean, uh, you know, in your business model canvas, who is actually gonna take a part in your business on a day-to-day -day basis or even a you know, once a month basis. You need to identify these uh, stakeholders because if you don't, you're not going to be able to develop a business that can support them all. And that's the key thing here, right? Again, taking the focus away from the the tech, the application into more of the business, right? What drives your business? So once you've identified who your key stakeholders are, you've got to understand what are their end goals, right? So what is the ultimate objective for each of these people? So if you take an example of an e-commerce site, very simple. Uh, I'll give you an example of one that I used to work on. It was like a beauty uh, product site, mostly for women and women between, you know, the, the, the main customer base was, let's say, 18 to 45, right? So 
what are we asking these people to do? What's the end goal for each of these stakeholders? Obviously, for an e-commerce site, it's to buy stuff, right? But also, you as a business, you want to maximize their shopping cart experience, right? Or it could be that you want to maximize the range of the products that they're buying, or it's maximizing, you know, the offers, the additional bits that they they might be getting after they built the product. So you know, follow-on services, etc. You've got to figure out from a business perspective, what are the objectives? What do you want these guys to do? So a customer is pretty simple, but then you're looking at employees, right? What are the key actions your employees are going to perform? So for example, with e-commerce, it's to support the business, right? So it could be customer service where you're looking for your employees to, to know enough information about the customer who's ringing up or emailing or whatever, so that they can provide accurate and timely support to these people. In addition, it may well be that you know you want to enhance the the information given to the, to your customer to your employees simply because you want to know who exactly should be getting the best treatment, the best service, right? So you you've got to really understand what are the end goals. What are you as a business trying to drive your customers or your your stakeholders to do, and what level of you know service are you providing around your offering? And also, you know, what data do you need to do to measure success? Which I think is also something that is really very well often looked over at the early stages of a business, right? You need KPIs, you need metrics, right? To understand how you're, how successful your business is. So again, great ones for e-commerce are, you know, who signs up but never purchases, you know, who signs up and how long does it take for them to make their first purchase, right? How often do they repeat purchase? All of these things that, you know, are information you really want to know, but you've got to start thinking about this early on. So you can start building those data structures into the, into the system. So once you've identified the what, so you now know who's doing stuff within your business and you know what their objectives are, whether they're an employee, whether they're a vendor, uh, whether they're a, uh, a customer, you want to know how they're going to do it. So let's take the, the vendor example. Let's say, for example, you've got a supplier of goods that, that you're selling online. You'll want to make sure that that vendor, the key you know, goal for that vendor, the key objective for that vendor is for you to get the best prices out of them and for you to be able to select the best products that they offer based on the profit margins and based on frequency of purchase, et cetera, et cetera, right? So the question then becomes is how do you streamline that process of buying from that vendor? Similarly, how do you, how are people going to interact with your platform? How are your customers going to interact? How do you get them to the shopping cart and purchase position as quickly as possible? What are the processes? And this is something that a lot of founders really look over. They don't really think about what are the key steps? What are the value chains within my business? What are the key steps that someone's going to have to go through to get to the objective that we've identified in the previous slide, right? So each of your different stakeholders should have a set of objectives and you should then be able to define how they achieve those objectives. And then as you look at and build up this essentially a bit, you know, a process map, you should be able to look at points within that map. Okay, where where do different processes intersect? Where can you optimize various processes? Maybe you've got too many steps to get to, to the end of one of them. Uh, and this all helps you essentially with design, UI, UX, right? Once you have these processes down and you understand the value chain, so really where you bring value to the customer and where you get value from the customer, you're able then to kind of say, okay, I now know what the end-to-end -end process looks like. Let's go design a UI UX that fulfills that and fulfills it in a way that is um, optimal for you and for the customer. So once you've gone through the who, the what, and the how, the other questions are when. Now, this is very, very important because, again, this is the, the next three keys here that we're going to talk about are, are things that, again, I, I find that are quite overlooked. So, for example, you're not going to buy from your vendor every day, right? You're going to buy from your vendor once a month, maybe once a quarter, maybe once every six months, right? So what data do you need to have at hand quickly? Because, you know, if you're not doing something every day, then that information is not always necessarily with you. But if you need to quickly search something and go and find it, what data do you need in order to, to access it? And again, uh, with customers, right? When are they buying? When you, you, you want to understand, you know, what are, the, are these people? Are you, do you have seasonal buyers? Do you have regular buyers? Do you have one-offs? Why do you have that, right? These are the things that, you know, you, you want to be able to understand because, again, you can build this into your platform, right? So, for example, you know, one of my pet hates is that when I have subscriptions to lots of different SaaS platforms and once a month I need to go in and find the invoices, I forget 
where they are, right? And so if you've got a tool that allows a user to quickly go and identify, oh yeah, my invoices are here, I can quickly download them or they get sent once a month to me via email, that makes me a lot happier, right? And it means that I have to do less work at the at the month end in order in order to do my um, accounts. So these are things like once you've understood the the chains, you've got to then understand how often these people are doing it and when they're doing it. Because that also then allows you to put resources into different timings, right? So if you know that, for example, every summer, this is a good example from when we were in uh, e-commerce business in Norway, we used to get garden furniture. Garden furniture used to be bought up at least three months before the summer season. So we knew that we would put those goods in and there would be a surge of people as soon as those goods came on that would then buy them. So we knew that we needed to allocate resources, whether tech resources or additional customer service or whatever, during those periods because we understood when people were buying. So moving on to where. Now, this is interesting because it's, again, something that may not be very obvious to people. Construction, for example, we had a, uh, you know, we've had construction clients, people go out there wanting to, um, you know, they've, they've got their users out on the field and there's no um, there's no connectivity. And so therefore they need to be able to have data to hand and stored locally, right? So the where has a lot of different dimensions, right? It's not necessarily about your physical, just about your physical location, but it's also about, you know, where in the where in the where in the business are they are they doing this work? So a great example is a health and safety company we're working with at the moment, right? So they have induction kiosks so when you go onto the factory floor you can get training as to all the health and safety provisions there any safety alerts etc cetera, etc cetera. but that's a standalone kiosk but that data needs to then be seen on a uh, by a manager in a web application so again when you're beginning to design the ways in which your stakeholders are actually interacting you may have different solutions for different people depending on when and where they need to do things right it may be a mobile application or with that that has um you know data stored locally it may well be a web application that doesn't right so there's there's different there's different things that you need to to understand about how people are where people are working with so that you can design the right architecture and, and technology system for them and again you've got the whole compliance issue so where are you storing your so, uh, storing your data you know do you need to kind of if you're if you are doing things overseas what regulatory uh, frameworks do you need to make sure you adopt? Are there any special specific rules for compliance and risks that you you then need to take account of, right? Uh, I mean, I know for a fact that when I was working in Thailand, for example, in the e-commerce business and you're selling to Europe, you needed to kind of, you still need to take advantage, you know, you need, still need to implement all the GDPR regulations and yeah, there are some, you know, fiscal regulations as well that you need to, um, and consumer acts that you also need to kind of uh, deal with. So, all of these things you need to make sure that you're you're on top of and aware of. Now, the last, and it's probably the the most important, is the why. And again, this is the key. This is the USP of your business that we're talking about here. What we're asking is, why would do people come to you? Is it because you're the cheapest? Is it because you're the simplest to use? Do you have the nice, pretty colors on the website? What is it exactly that come, people come to you? Why is it? that they will go to you rather than the competitors. And what are you doing differently that sets you apart from anyone else around you, right? And this has obviously got to be the core of your business. If there's if if you're launching into an already saturated market, how are you standing out? And how are you actually motivating people to come back into your into your platform to to essentially repeat purchasing? So all of those six things together, the who, the what, the how, the when, the where, the why, are all basic questions you need to think about before you even start looking to build anything from a technology point of view or building out an MVP. And, and your MVP doesn't necessarily have to have huge amounts of tech. So moving on to that specific uh, piece, because you know I'm Managing Director of Atom CTO and I haven't talked about technology uh, when we're talking about product development. My first question is always, and I've had this with a few of you on the um, on the office hours, is that do you really need to build anything to get started? Okay, if you're in deep tech or you're in some sort of uh, industry that's digitization or e-commerce or whatever, you definitely need technology, right? But then if you're in a business that doesn't necessarily need a huge amount of tech, maybe you can leverage what exists out there, some, you know, the products that exist that you can get on a subscription basis just to kind of get yourself going. Uh, and when you're looking to build tech, right, you need you need really to make sure 
that every penny that you're spending is something that is going to be valuable to the business as a whole, right? So as I mentioned on this slide, you're dealing with increasing revenue, retaining customers, reducing risk, all of these different things. When you're about to engage with anyone to develop any tech, you need to make sure that these that tech is directed at one of these areas, right? It has to build value. There has to be a return on that investment. The other key thing about tech is making sure that you can use it to improve your business continuity, to reduce your risks. Because this is another thing that I hope you're all doing is you you should all be understanding your business risk. What different types of risks are there? There's technical, there's operational, there's reputational, there's all these different areas of risk that you need to look at. And then you can figure out whether technology can help you mitigate any of those risks and put in action plans to, to essentially you know, prevent those risks from happening. So my point of view with technology for early stage founders is always to say, build what you the, the least that you need to build to get your business going. And if you're gonna build, it needs to have an ROI or it needs to reduce your risk. If it's not doing any of that, then there's no reason to ha have it in because there's other ways, better ways of you spending your money, time and resources, right? So I've had another slide. So this slide is going to look a bit weird, but I've added another slide in because I realized that um, the last time I gave this this presentation was with the Founder Institute in London, and there were two other presenters covering different areas. What I wanted to do in, in this last slide is to say, look, if you are going to start building tech and, and developing a product, then what you need to do is make sure you do these things that are listed up here, right? First things first, make sure you have a contract. I've spoken to so many founders who just don't even have a contract with their development teams. Make sure you have a contract, make sure you know who owns the IP, make sure that there's at least some sort of milestone payments that are going on. You're not just randomly paying for, for things. Make sure you also have access to everything, right? And when I mean everything, I mean everything, right? They, there's no reason why any development team should be working with their own repositories they should be working in your repository you should be admin of that repository uh, similarly with infrastructure there's no reason why you should be working on their infrastructure they should be able to spin up something that you are able to have access to right and in this day and age is there's no excuse for them saying oh well it's on our servers it's if you if they're going to develop it you can put the credit card down and if you're paying them for this you should own it right the other key things and and you know, if you follow my LinkedIn, there's a number of articles I've written, which kind of cover a lot of this stuff in more detail. But you need to make sure that you always have oversight on the projects. You need to make sure that if things aren't working, then get 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 them fixed quickly. Don't be held hostage to your developers. And I see so many times founders just throwing good money after bad, just because they feel, oh, well, they've just promised this. The development team's promised this. They'll, they'll get it done next week. They'll get it done next week. And next week is like a year. So... My point here is make sure when you're, if you are deciding to build tech, engage with your tech teams, make sure you own everything and assert yourself, right? You are the customer. You're the one who's paying them money. They don't owe you anything really uh, other than the quality of the work, right? They shouldn't be, they shouldn't be uh, taking anything else from you, right? Everything is yours. You rightfully own it all. So I hope that's all helped. Again, what I really like to do here is stress that these six keys, and I'll go back to the original slide, these keys need to be thought about before you do anything. If you start going ahead and start trying to build and start trying to design a product without thinking of any of this stuff, you're bound to fail. It's just going to take you longer. You'll get, uh, you'll spend, you'll waste money, you'll waste time, and you'll waste effort, which are three things that you guys don't have much of. All right. Thanks for that. And as I said, if any of you guys want to get in contact with me, I've got some office hours open, or you can just um, email me. I think most of you guys have my email address. Thanks a lot, guys. Good luck.